For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. We're going to begin our worship this morning by singing Amazing Grace. You know that it is the most recorded hymn in history. So this morning, would you please lend your voices? We're going to sing all five verses. Would you please stand? people said amen Amen. thank you thank you and singing out those wonderful hymns and only christians can sing that song really amazing grace when we all get to heaven a lot of folks sing it but to make it really true you got to have like you said experience that amazing grace and i hope you have and if you have not maybe today be the day 
and I pray that it will. So take your Bible and go with me to the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 7, as we continue our series. I've been calling it Unlikely Heroes, taking a look at um, some of the judges that God raised up to be deliverers for the children of Israel at a time in Israel's history when they didn't have a king. And the Bible says everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes, not what was right in God's eyes. And, of course, that led to chaos and disobedience to God, which is uh, why God had to discipline his children. And so in the first two chapters of Judges, we learned that Israel had turned away from God. And God's word is very clear. Only obedience to God brings blessing. God does not bless sin. He does not bless disobedience. Disobedience to God from God's children bring God's discipline. And so from chapters 3 to chapter 16, God had to discipline, chasten Israel to allow their enemies to afflict them. And then when Israel would cry out to God for, for relief, cry out to God for deliverance, God would send them a judge to deliver them. And thus far, we've looked at Othniel, we've looked at Ehud, we looked at Shamgar, we looked at Deborah. And for the past few messages, we've been looking at Gideon, who, who is covered the most in the book of Judges. His story is in chapter 6 through 8. And so from chapter 7 now, starting in verse 9, down to verse 15, I'll be preaching on this subject, continuing encouragement. And so let's read our text and follow the reading of God's holy, inspired, and errant, infallible word with prayer. The Bible says, it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, speaking to Gideon, Arise, go down against the camp, speaking of the Midianite camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pure, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pure, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Malachites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, Lord, I ask again, Lord, for that which I do not deserve And they definitely cannot buy it. But Lord, I ask for a fresh touch, a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you will empower me to preach your word of truth. To preach it in love, but Father, not in the flesh, but in your power. With boldness, with clarity of speech. That I decrease, you increase, Lord. Put your thoughts in my mind, your words in my mouth. Bind the devil and any demon spirit that tries to cause us any type of distractions to lose focus from hearing what you, want us to, what you want to say today, Lord. And Father, I pray, O oh God, when the invitation is given, Lord, that the Holy Spirit presence will be so strong that anyone under Holy Spirit conviction will surrender to your call today. So we're just looking forward to what you want done. Have your way, and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. One of the great British preachers of time past was a man named Joseph Parker. He's wrote many Bible commentaries. A lot of his writings are sermons that he actually preached. And he said this about Gideon. He said, Gideon is one of those men who required constant encouragement. And actually, encouragement is something that we all need from time to time. It doesn't matter how strong your faith is. It doesn't matter how committed you are to the Lord. It's very easy to get discouraged from time to time is why we all need continual encouragement. Encouragement is necessary to our walk of faith. And the Bible is clear as born-again believers, members of the body of Christ, we are to encourage one another. You see, without encouragement... Um, hardship can become even more difficult to deal with. And our will to go on and not give up begins to wane. Without encouragement, life can feel so pointless and very burdensome. 
Without encouragement, we can easily be overwhelmed by the real pains and challenges in our life that we have to face at times. Without encouragement, we can even feel unloved. Without encouragement, we can fall for the lie of the devil that God doesn't love us anymore and he doesn't care about us anymore. And so encouragement, especially from the Word of God, really gives us that will and motivation to carry on. It gives us the bigger picture and helps to prevent burnout. Encouragement really helps us experience the abundant life that Jesus said we can have as long as we live on this earth, despite the challenges and the valleys that we have to go through in life. Because when we are encouraged to know who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ, then that truth alone really motivates us to press on and not give up, especially when we face the difficult and challenging times. Well, encouragement was something that this man Gideon definitely needed on a regular basis. Now, he had a lot to discourage him. I believe he was discouraged because of his own inadequacies and his own lack of experience. I mean, we already learned that he was just a humble farmer. When God called him to this position to be a leader for God's people, he had no military experience at all. He had no battle or soldier experience. He had never been trained in the art of war. He was from a tribe that was really just an ordinary tribe in the eyes of the people that day. They had tribes in Israel that was considered to be a little more prestigious, and his tribe was not part of that, that tribe or one of those considered to be one of the higher-ups. And then the task at hand that he was given by God seemed to be humanly impossible. I mean, God called Gideon to overcome an enemy army of 135,000 battle-tested Midianites with just 300 men whose sole qualification was they lapped up water like a dog. And so what Gideon had to work with didn't really seem all that great. I mean, 300 untrained men. And then their equipment that he was given to fight the war was each man had a torch, a trumpet, and a jar. And so I'm sure he was thinking, man, these are strange weapons to fight this war against this well-trained, well-armed enemy. Plus, here's a man who never really wanted this job to begin with. He didn't want to be the judge of Israel. He didn't apply for the job. He knew he had never um, been trained for combat. He'd never gone through a leadership course or seminar. So here's a man who's going to face a bloodthirsty army of 135,000 people who have just terrorized Israel for seven years. And so this very common, ordinary, humble farmer has 300 men in his army standing there with water still dripping out of their mouth. He's holding a trumpet, an earthen vessel, a lighted torch, and God tells Gideon, go now and overcome the Midianites. So no doubt Gideon looked at what he had to work with, and most likely got very discouraged and doubtful. And you know, when you and I look around today at what we as God's people are supposed to be doing as children of God concerning God's kingdom work, we could easily get discouraged. But think about this. The whole world is lost in sin. The Bible says that the road to hell is a broad road and that there are many people on it. The road to heaven is just a narrow road that only few people find. You know what that means? We're outnumbered. There's less of us as saved, born-again Christians than those who are lost. Most people in this world, sadly, have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that includes those who are religious and play church. So that means we as born-again Christians marching in the army of the Lord are in the minority. The majority of people in this world are lost and hell-bound. And the Bible says the God of this age, speaking of the devil, has blinded their minds to the light of the glorious gospel. And so multitudes of people in this world are dead in trespasses of sin, and many don't even realize that they're lost and separated from God and on their way to hell. And then when we look at the state of the church today, whereby many of God's people who are saved and they're on their way to heaven... But yet they're just not committed to God nor to his church as they should be. Sadly, far too many of God's people today have seen to have forgot about the purpose of the church. Listen, church is not man's idea. It is God's. God established the church. 
And the purpose is to reach the lost with the gospel, to baptize new converts, and to make disciples. The outside ministry of the church is evangelism. That involves reaching the lost. The inside ministry of the church is edification. That's where your discipleship and your fellowship and building one another up in the faith comes. But sadly, far too many Christians today have lost that vision. More and more people today only attend church when it's really convenient, rather out of Holy Spirit conviction, to be obedient to God on the Lord's day. There are a lot of folks who say they love Jesus, but they only read their Bible and they only pray when they have a crisis. As long as things is going good, they forget about God until the next crisis comes. And so when you think about the majority of the people in this world being lost... And the majority of Christians who are in the minority are not committed to God like they should be. It can be very easy for us as Christians who are trying to do what's right to be discouraged. That's why we all need encouragement. Not to lose our focus on the calling and our purpose. And our ultimate goal is not to be successful in the world's eyes. Our purpose and ultimate goal at all costs should be faithful to God in all that we say and do. Well, Gideon had 300 guys who were not the most inspiring crowd to be with, but God had put Gideon in this position to lead this group to victory over the Midianites, which outnumbered them and definitely outmatched them from a human point of view. So Gideon definitely needed some encouragement to press on and not give up and don't doubt what God had already promised him. And so from this story, we see God knows that his children are weak in the faith at times. And God knows exactly when we just need to be encouraged. And God just has a way to encourage our faith just when we need it the most. I mean, we learn in the Bible that King David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, that's a good word for all of us because if you're waiting for somebody else to encourage you, you may never be encouraged. Sadly, there are some people in our world today who actually believe their gift in life is discouragement. I mean, they got up this morning and said, I wonder who I can discourage at church today. I mean, they, there's the type of people who are always negative. They love to gossip about other people and things that they don't like. And sometimes people like that, they can discourage you even without saying a word. It's sometimes with, just with the tone of their voice, just in a couple of words. You may say to the person, isn't this a beautiful day? It is. Or, didn't we have a wonderful service last Sunday? We did. Those people are what you call passive-aggressive discouragers. So I want you to know, if you want to be encouraged on a regular basis, you have to really learn to start encouraging yourself in the Lord. And I want to show you three truths right from these scriptures that can be a constant encouragement to you on any given day. First, like Gideon, we can be encouraged constantly by the settled promises of God. The settled promises of God. Notice verse 9. The Bible says it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, speaking to Gideon, now here's the promise. God says, arise, go down to the camp. That's the Midianite camp. I have delivered it into your hand. Now, God's already told Gideon this, t- this promise three times that he's going to give him the victory. Now, this will be the fourth time that God has told Gideon the promise of victory lies ahead. God had explained to Gideon that he's going to obviously have to have a battle with these folks, but the war has already been won. But the Lord knew that Gideon was still had some fear in his heart. And that fear had to be dealt with before he could move forward to claim this victory that God had promised. That's why fear and faith don't, can't stay in the same place. If you have fear, it's going to cause you to doubt. It's going to cause you not to, to step out in faith. The Bible teaches, though, without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says, you know, a lot about hope. The Bible says a lot about love. And it's amazing to me that in the book of Hebrews, a whole chapter is given to explain faith and give us examples of faith and show us the importance of faith and to reiterate that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You see, it's our faith that really connects our weakness to God's almightiness. In fact, I want to say that again. It is our faith in the Lord that really connects our weakness with God's almightiness. Where does faith come from? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is fueled by the word of God. The book of books where we see our, we get to nourish our, from the bread of life, the living water that nourishes our soul, it strengthens our faith. Now, as you well know, there are a lot of people that call this book the good book. And I know they mean well when they say that this is the good book, but I'm going to tell you in love, 
This book that we call the Holy Bible is better than the good book because this is God's book. This is not just some classic book in somebody's library. This book, the book of books, God's book is alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. His, God's word will never return void. The Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. It's not only alive, but it gives life to those who receive its truth. The Holy Scripture fuels our faith. It inspires our faith. It enlarges our faith. It helps us to believe and trust God no matter what we face in life. And as long as we receive the Word of God by faith, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and enlarges our faith. And God loves to use His promises in His Word to encourage us as His children. Now remember, God had already told Gideon three times that He's already going to give Israel the victory. He reassured him by giving him three specific signs. You remember, he got fire from the rock. He got the wet fleece, the dry fleece that we saw in chapter 6. So basically, Gideon, with all this divine help, God promises, God signs. That really should have made him strong in the faith. But at this point, he still wasn't there yet. It was like it wasn't enough. And what's comforting to us is that God understands us. God, God doesn't condemn us when we're weak. God doesn't condemn us when you and I have doubts and fears. God in his love for us just continues to give us wisdom. And he doesn't scold us when we keep asking God for more wisdom because he tells us his word we can ask and he'll give us liberally. So he wants us to ask. Our great high priest in heaven sympathizes with our weaknesses and he gives us grace that's even more grace. The Bible says even where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So God knows and God always remembers that we are just dust and we're flesh and our flesh is weak. So here we see God encourages Gideon by giving him another promise to assure him of the victory that would take place if he would just step out in faith and do what God called him to do. Now remember, God's done giving him three promises, three signs. Now he's going to tell him the promise again the fourth time. He says, arise, go down to midnight camp. I have delivered them into your hand. A very clear promise from God who always keeps his promises. And, it's what, and God's promises is really what gives us hope. I don't care what you're going through in life. There's always a specific promise from God uh, about your need that you have that you can always hold on to. There's a specific promise from God for any challenge that you face in life. Are you sick in body? Have the doctors told you they've done all they can do? Over the years, and even recently, we've had several of our church family members, and I know you probably have some that you know real close, have been diagnosed with serious or even terminal illnesses. And any time I ever get the opportunity to call someone or go visit someone going through a serious illness or a terminal illness, I like to share the promise that Psalm 30 verse 2 says, I cry to the Lord and he heals me. You see, our Lord is the great physician who has power over any sickness and disease. And you may say, well, what about those folks who die from their terminal illness? Did God keep his promise? Yes. Because, see, God is sovereign. And if God chooses not to heal your body heal here, he gives you a better healing than heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord with no more sickness or suffering ever again. That's a win-win for a born-again Christian with the promise of God's healing. Think about it. If I stay, he'll be with me. If I go, I'll be with him. That is a win-win for a born-again Christian. So it doesn't matter if it's a physical challenge, an emotional challenge, a financial challenge, something with your family, something with your child or children, something with your job or business. I'm telling you, you can look into the Word of God and there's a promise in God's Word for the specific need that you face and you can claim that promise in faith. You, pr you pray that promise in your prayers. God's promises are His announcement that He loves you and He cares all about whatever we go through in life. And God put His promises in His Word even before we had need of the promise because God knows the beginning to the end. God knows what we're going to face in life. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our fears. He understands every emotion that we will ever experience in life. And so the promises of God remind us of the power of God who's able to perform every promise that He's made. And over and over again throughout the Word of God, we see where people of God stood on the promise of God. And over and over again in our own life, we can learn to practice that, to stand on the promises of God. Because God is always able to perform any promise that He makes. 
And in God's Word, we see many of God's promises that He made to His children come to pass, just as God said, because God is always faithful to His Word. So I'm telling you right now, you're not always going to be encouraged on your feelings. Your feelings can be up and down. And you're definitely not going to be encouraged by your circumstances because we know that we all can face some very challenging, difficult circumstances that can be discouraging and we don't feel good about it. Most people in general are not going to go out of their way to encourage you. But you can always learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. You think about the fact that King David said, I've been young and now I'm an old man, but I've never seen God's seed begging for bread. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means I shall not lack. Why? Because of God's promise. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. So all the way through the word of God, we can read about these great promises from God that, that, that God always delivered for his people. And when you read about the great promises that God promises to do for you and me, even today, and the fact that the Bible says all the promises from God are yes in Jesus Christ, knowing that, ought to stir in your heart and soul encouragement and build your faith stronger in the Lord and through your faith knowing you can lay hold of God's promise and trust God to bring it to pass his timing, his way for his glory. And so I'm just saying whatever you face in life, you can always be encouraged if you just hold on to the settled promises of God who promises us forgiveness, comfort, peace, strength, wisdom, and blessing by just believing in his promises. And the ultimate promise that covers any situation is Romans 8, 28. that says God can work all things out for good to those who love God. And so it doesn't matter what you face in life. There's a promise in God's word for you to claim. And like Gideon, you can be encouraged by the settled promises of God. But also, not only like Gideon can we be continually encouraged by the settled promises of God, But we can also be continually encouraged by, number two, the sovereign plan of God, the sovereign plan. God accommodates our weaknesses, and God is very patient. This I'm so thankful. Now, even though this man Gideon had gotten a promise from God for the fourth time, plus the three signs that God showed him, God says in verse 10, but if you're afraid to go down, go down to camp with Pura, you're certain. In other words, you ain't got to do this by yourself. I want you to go with Pura. I want to show you something. Now, God doesn't dismiss Gideon here. He doesn't scold him. He just says, look, if you're still afraid, if you, I want you to go down to the camp with pure your servant, and I'm going to let you see something. I'm going to let you hear something that's really going to encourage you. I'm so grateful God loves us in spite of us. I'm so thankful that God is faithful even when we're not. I've often said, I'm just amazed that God knew what he was getting when he got me. And what's more amazing, he still wants me after he got me. Because many times, I don't respond to him in faith like I should. I don't always have the attitude and behavior like I should. Aren't you glad for the patience and the grace and the mercy of the living God? God says to Gideon, okay, if you're still afraid, I want you to go down to the edge of the camp with pure and Listen, because you're going to hear a conversation between two of the Midianite soldiers. Now, those were the enemies. Now, I've already told you you're going to have the victory. But I'm going to let you hear that same message, that same promise that I've given you four times. I'm going to let you hear it right from the lips of the enemy. So God told Gideon to go down to the Midianite camp. And you're going to hear those Midianites speak about a dream. And you're going to hear another Midianite speak uh, of the interpretation of the dream. And basically God says, look, I just believe once you hear that, you're going to be encouraged to go do what I told you to do and experience the victory that I've already promised you. So look what the Bible says, verse 11. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened. That means encouraged to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now look what happens. Now, the Midianites and the Malachites, all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And the camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. In modern day language, that would be like saying you couldn't number the army personnel of the Midianites. You couldn't count the tanks that they would be riding in. Verse 13, and when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I've had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. So I want you to get the picture here. Gideon and his and Pura, his servant, now they have snuck down to the edge of the Midianite camp. 
And as they look around, they see the enemy soldiers as far as the eyes can see. I mean, they see camels as far as the eyes can see. And that's what the camels those soldiers would be riding on when they went into battle. And so they get close to this tent and they listen to a conversation between two enemy soldiers. And one of them says, I've had a dream. It's a strange dream. I dreamed this loaf of barley bread came in through the camp and hit a tent and the tent collapsed. Now let me explain to you about a loaf of barley bread. That's not a big loaf of bread at all. I mean, it'll be like the size of a biscuit. I mean, it was a sight to see a loaf of barley bread rolling into a tent. I mean, it's like a biscuit rolling in there. The barley bread was food of a common person that day. The poorest people would eat barley bread. It was very cheap. This was something very ordinary. And it rolled into the camp, flattened the tent. That's the dream that this Midianite soldier had. Well, the other Midianite soldier listening says, I know exactly what that dream means. Look at verse 14. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian in the whole camp. So get this. Now, God's done giving Gideon this promise four times. Now, the enemy soldier is quoting the promise that God gave to Gideon, and the enemy soldier don't even realize that God's using him to discourage, uh, to, to, to encourage a discouraged leader to lead the people of God to victory that God had already promised. So basically what this enemy soldier says is, and don't miss this, he said this barley bread rolls into the camp, it flattens the tent, and he said that barley loaf, that is the sword of Gideon. That means we're sunk. So now when Gideon heard this, Gideon didn't mind then being compared to a barley loaf. Because he knew that God was going to use him to defeat the Midianites, to deliver the land that was in bondage according to God's plan, according to God's promise. So here's what I want you to see. The power and the strength to knock that tent down was not in that barley loaf. The power and the strength was whoever threw that barley loaf into the camp. It was like God went bowling. And he had that barley loaf biscuit in his hand and he threw that barley loaf biscuit like a bowling ball into the camp of the Midianites. And what it tells us is the barley loaf biscuit didn't have to be strong. It was the sheer force behind the throw that overthrew the tent. That means it was not going to be the strength of Gideon that would overcome the Midianites. It was going to be the power of a holy God on Gideon that God was going to use to take them out. Now, I don't know what you're facing this morning. But I'm telling you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have the same power of God cursing through your soul. There's not a demon nor the devil himself that can stand against you. There's not a mountain that can stand against you. Between what God has planned for you, nothing can stop the power of God. Whatever your problem is, whatever your need is, whatever you're up against, just remember, like Gideon, you are a barley biscuit in the hand of God. And when God loses you, the devil better get out of the way. Hallelujah. Well, the, the dream that this enemy had shows us that God had an unseen plan. And his unseen hand was guiding the whole process to ensure that his plan would be done according to his promise. So right here we see that God not only used this dream from the enemy and the interpretation to encourage Gideon, but he used that same dream and the interpretation to mess with the enemy's mind. This was divine psychological warfare. God used the dream and the interpretation of this dream to dishearten and to discourage the enemy before the battle ever took place. That shows us again the sovereign plan of God is always at work many times behind the scenes in ways that we don't see or ever understand. The mysteries of God, the secrets of God belong to him. And in the Bible, we learn that sometimes God did communicate his truth through dreams. We see that many times in the Old Testament with Jacob and Joseph and Solomon and Daniel. And in the New Testament, Joseph, the husband of Mary. And God not only spoke his truth through dreams through believers, but also to non-believers, such as Abimelech and Nebuchadnezzar and Joseph's fellow prisoners, as well as the Pharaoh and Pilate's wife, just to name a few. But we must not conclude from those examples that that is the normal method that God communicates with his people today. Because we know dreams can be deceptive, and the Bible even warns us of that. Apart from divine interpretation, we would not know the correct interpretation. 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that God, who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, but has in these last days spoke to us by his Son. Today in the church age, the age of grace, you and I are blessed to have the completed word of God. And the best way for us to get God's guidance and God's interpretation is right through the word of God. You pray, you seek God, and you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit in you, and you, as you watch the circumstances unfold around you. You see, you just keep your faith in the unsettled promises of God that never fail us, and knowing that God's going to fulfill His sovereign plan for our life, His way, His time, for a greater purpose in His glory. That's God's plan. You may say, Pastor, I have a son, I have a daughter, I have a grandchild, or maybe I have a spouse, I have a, a family member, a friend who's got far away from God, and they won't listen to me. They, won't even, uh, they don't even want to talk to me about the Lord. Well, let me remind you that the unseen hands of God can always reach where your hands can't reach. God reached right into the minds of the enemy here. The enemy, many now, he's psyching them out before the battle ever took place. God has already convinced this large enemy that they've already lost the battle. And they hadn't even been attacked yet. So I'm just telling you, the same God with his unseen hands can reach right into the heart of your prodigal son, your prodigal daughter, your prodigal spouse, your prodigal family member or friend. Regardless, if they want to talk to you or not, the unseen hand of God can reach in and squeeze their heart. That's why you need to take them to the throne room of God and turn them over to God and just ask God to deal with them his way in his time according to his purpose and plan. Because God's ways are higher than our ways. You go to God in prayer. You stand on his promises. You pray that the unseen hand of the unseen Holy Spirit reach inside and grab a hold of them with conviction until they cry out for mercy. And it's amazing what God can do. You see, God can go with his unseen hands where we can't go. And the good news is that the sovereign plan of God is always at work. Even when we can't see God working, he's still working. That's why the hymn writer was inspired to write the precious hymn, Have Faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches over his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. So like Gideon, we can be encouraged continually by the settled promises of God. We can be continually encouraged by the sovereign plan of God. There's always the unseen plan, and God's unseen hand is always at work in full control. But here's a third truth. That encouraged Gideon and can definitely encourage you and me at all times. And that's number three, the sure presence of God. The sure presence. God is here with us at all times. And God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. From time to time, you hear our choir give us the call to worship. And they'll sing, He is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. He is here, holy, holy, I will bless his name again. He is here, listen closely, hearing, calling out your name. He is here, you can touch him and you'll never be the same. What an encouragement that truth is. Well, I want you to notice what Gideon does as he, after he hears this conversation between these two enemies. Verse 15, so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and it's interpreted that he worshiped. That's important. Before he went back to assemble his little army, the Bible says he worshiped. Gideon was so overwhelmed by the Lord's goodness and mercy and the Lord just so patient with him and was showing him time and time again to encourage him and to build up his faith. He just fell on his face in submission and gratitude and worshiped the Lord. Joshua did the same thing before he, he went to take the city of Jericho. And that's a good practice for all of us to follow because before we can ever be successful soldiers for God, marching in the Lord's army, we must first become sincere worshipers. Worship to God is a wonderful practice because it will encourage and strengthen your faith. But also worship the Lord is warfare because the devil don't want you or me to worship God. That's why he gives you every excuse in the world to stop you from coming to church, to stop you from hearing the word of God. The devil give you every excuse in the world not to pray, not to, to seek God's face. He don't want you to worship. But many times in the Word of God, when you see God's people, before they went to battle, God calls them to worship Him first. Think about Paul and Silas. When they were in that jail and there was no way out, what did they do? They lifted their voices and they began to worship the Lord. That word worship means to ascribe worth to and the Bible says Gideon worshiped God. That means he's ascribing worth to God. 
And in worship, we're saying, God, you alone are omnipotent. You're all-powerful. God, you alone are omniscient. You're all-knowing. God, you alone are omnipresent. It means everywhere at all times. God, you alone, you are Savior. Lord, you are the Creator. God, I give you all the praise and glory. And the Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people. Many times in the act of worship, our circumstances may not change, but yet we are changed for the good in the circumstance. In this case, these 135,000 Midianites were still there. The army that Gideon has been given to fight them with, they're still the same 300 guys. So the circumstances are the same. But now Gideon has been changed in the midst of these circumstances. And many times in worship, when you draw near to God and feed on God's word, when you're facing adverse circumstances in life, circumstances you thought were going to destroy you, God has actually ordained to develop you and make you stronger in the faith. There's a lot of times the deep valleys we go through, God teaches us lessons we would not learn unless we go through those valleys. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So in verse 15 we learn a couple of things about worship. Worship is acknowledgement of the presence of God. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you face. We can always be sure the Lord is with us. As the body of Christ collectively or as a born-again Christian individually, when you worship the Lord, you're acknowledging God's presence in your life. We acknowledge the fact that He is real, He's alive, He is with me, and He has promised to never leave me nor forsake me. But also another thing we do when we worship is not only acknowledge his presence, but we appreciate his presence. As we worship the Lord, we worship with praise and thanksgiving, and we're appreciating the presence of God. We acknowledge, we appreciate his presence, and by that we are encouraged in the Lord. You see, in worship, we're saying, God, I just want to magnify you. God, I thank you so much that you love me so much first. You did for me what I can never do for myself. Lord, you are all powerful. Lord, you are always on the throne. You're always in full control. Lord, you know everything. There's nothing, there's nothing that ever happens that goes beyond your notice. Lord, I'm so thankful that you love me so much. You sent your only begotten son not only to pay my sin debt in full, but to guarantee me eternal life. God, I want to thank you that with you all things are possible. I want to thank you, God, that you are light, that you are spirit, and I want to thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord, thank you again for loving me and caring for me. And so I'm doing my part to worship you in spirit and in truth. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's why we sing, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. May that be a constant act of worship so that we can continually be encouraged in the Lord, knowing that regardless of what we face, he is here with us. Well, Gideon worshiped. God didn't change, but Gideon sure changed. He went from fear to faith. He went back down to his camp. He said, okay, guys, let's go. God's going to deliver them in our hands just as he's promised. Well, as you know, all people need encouragement. And one of the best things that you could ever do for yourself is be like King David and learn to encourage yourself in the Lord, but also be an encourager to others. A while back, I heard about this unusual group of people in the islands of the South Pacific. There were some villagers having an unusual approach to cutting down trees. While they were cutting down a tree, if they come to one that was too big for them to cut down with an axe, they believed they had a group of people in their tribe that could uh, cut the tree down by screaming at it. I mean, they, there were certain people, they thought they had this unusual power that would kill the spirit in the tree, the tree would die and then fall over. So what they would do for 30 days is they would bring those people there and they would sneak up on the tree and then scream at the top of their voice to the tree. Now we're too sophisticated for that. We know better than that. We're not going to go around and scream at trees. But you know what we do? We scream at our phones. We scream at our computers. We scream at our TVs. Some of you may scream at your spouse. You scream at your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You scream at your children. You scream at traffic. Listen. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but let me tell you something. The words that you say, the words that you scream can break somebody's heart and crush their spirit. Words you use and how you use them can do a lot of damage to a person. 
I want you to understand that your words have the power to encourage or to discourage. Your words have the power to build somebody up or to rob somebody of their faith and to diminish their Christian joy. The power of life and death, according to Proverbs, is in the tongue. Well, in God's Word, we learned there was a man named Barnabas. Barnabas was given a nickname. It was, he was known as the son of encouragement. Now, that wasn't his birth name. Joseph was his birth name, J-O-S-E-S. -S. His parents didn't call him Barnabas. Other people called him Barnabas. The disciples called him Barnabas. Why? Because he was such an encouragement. He encouraged people with a smile. He encouraged people with his gift. He encouraged people with his words. He encouraged people with his time. Every time you read about Barnabas, he was constantly encouraging somebody. That's why he was known as the son of encouragement. And we need more people like that today. Because all people need encouragement. Odds are in a crowd of this size, there's people here today that need encouragement. Jesus himself, who modeled the Christian life perfectly, was an encourager. Think about him. One day he said to the disciples, they're going to nail me to the cross, they're going to crucify me, but listen, on the third day I'm going to be raised to new life, and they're never going to crucify me again. Jesus told his disciples, look, one of these days I'm going to go away, but don't be discouraged. Let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you because one of these days I'm coming back. And where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said, in this world you're going to have trouble. But take heart. Don't fear. Don't be discouraged because I have overcome the world. One day Jesus was standing in the cemetery with two sisters that were so disordered and discouraged because their brother was dead. And Jesus said, don't be discouraged. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. You see, encouragement makes it easier for us to live in this fallen world in a more holier way. Encouragement makes it easier to love others as Jesus loves. Encouragement gives us hope. Encouragement really helps us through times of discipline and testing. Encouragement nurtures patience and kindness. Encouragement makes it easier to sacrifice our own desires for the advancement of God's kingdom. Bottom line, encouragement is what really helps us live the Christian life the way God wants us to live it. And today God wants you and me both to be encouragers. Just as he wants you and I to be continually encouraged. So I'm just saying, from this day forward, won't you make a point to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord with the settled promises of God, the sovereign plan of God, and the sure presence of God. I want to challenge you because you're not only being encouraged by this truth, because I hope this message has been an encouragement to you, but I want to challenge you to offer that cup of encouragement to someone else that God places in your path every single day. Because you will also be encouraged more in your daily walk with the Lord by you being an encourager to others. Stay away from the temptation to be negative and to be discouraging to others. Make a point, be encouraging. And by that, you can bring joy to the heart of God by you making that decision daily to draw near to God, rely on Him, trust Him, seek Him, obey Him. And by that choice, do you realize you please God? And how much more encouraging can it be than to know that you're pleasing God? God always blesses obedience. And remember, it's not about being successful. It's about being faithful. You want to hear God say, well done? Make it a point each day to please God. And you're not pleasing God any more in life than when you are an encourager. Stay away from the devil's tool of discouragement because that's a tool of the devil. The tool of the Lord is encouragement. And I pray you have already been encouraged. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. I'm going to ask our music team to get ready for our time of invitation. And this is the most important time of the service because God's word has been given. Prayer hearts have received. And now it's time for you to respond to God's call in your life. There may be some here today who've never been saved. I don't know everybody's heart. I can't see inside your heart, but the Lord can. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, today you can do that. 
right there at your pew. All you got to do is admit that you're a sinner and ask Jesus to come into your heart based on what he did for you at the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the only gospel that saves the lost sinner. When you invite Jesus into your heart, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are a saved, born-again child of God. Nothing can change that. Oh, Holy Spirit, Lord, take this time of invitation. I pray, Lord, the hearts have been tugged as well as encouraged just to be faithful to you, Lord, in whatever your call is today in this service. We just want your way to be done, your will and your greater purpose. In Jesus' holy name, amen.